Welcome. It's great to have you join us to share in worship today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Lord, direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we come to a time of confession and let's just take a moment to reflect on the week just gone. Let's call to mind maybe one or two things we want to confess to God. The Gospel calls us to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. As we offer ourselves to him in penitence and faith, we renew our confidence and our trust in his mercy. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done, and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us for all that is past, and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now the collect, the special prayer for today. Creator God, you made us all in your image. May we discern you in all that we see and serve you in all that we do, 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Edna Bender is now going to read for us our first Bible passage. A reading from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfilment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Edna, thanks for that. And now Tony Warren is going to read our Gospel. Mark, chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, He is Elijah. And still others claimed, He is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask for me anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you, up to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a dish. 
the king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a dish. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Tony, thank you very much for that. Our world, it can be a pretty tough place. The last year has taught us that even in a wealthy and established democracy, we are not immune from the suffering that afflicts our world. And whilst the pandemic continues, there are also still the wars, the tensions, the famines, the natural disasters that can make life so very hard for some folk. Now you might think, indeed you might even hope, that coming to worship could be a respite from all this, but clearly not. Our Gospel passage today recounts an act of casual brutality every bit as awful as anything else we might hear or read about today. I think what makes this story even odder in a church context is the way that we respond to it in our worship. After reading of the gruesome end of John the Baptist, I'll say in our church service, this is the gospel of the Lord. And everyone responds, praise to Christ our Lord. Which begs the question, are we listening? Is this really gospel? Is it really good news? And do we really respond to such an awful event with the words, praise to Christ our Lord? Well, I'll come back to those hard questions a bit later. Now, in recent weeks, we've been following through St Mark's Gospel, and it's become clear that behind his Gospel is a question, and the question is this, who is Jesus? So it is that in the opening verses of that Gospel passage, we hear of yet more speculation about who Jesus might be. And one of the speculators is King Herod. And his novel contribution to this debate is the suggestion that Jesus is actually John the Baptist raised from the dead. Now, is this a sense of guilt? Is it black humour? Is it a veiled suggestion that Jesus might well go the same way? Now, as usual, we don't know because all Mark does is record Herod's words and leaves us to draw our conclusions. But what this does do is give Mark the occasion to relate the story of John the Baptist's death. And as we heard, it is a sorry tale of the abuse of power. Petty jealousy, too much wine, a boastful promise and unwillingness to lose face all combine with a callous disregard for human life. And John the Baptist dies as a victim of this toxic mixture. So what on earth are we to make of this story? Well, one of the pitfalls of reading short passages of scripture as we do in worship is that we often end up taking episodes right out of context. And sometimes we need to put them back into context in order to make any kind of sense. And I would suggest that this is one such case. Immediately before this passage, Mark has told of how Jesus sends out his disciples two by two. How is it that they are to do this work of God's kingdom? Well, they are to go out utterly vulnerable. Jesus' exact words to his friends are these, take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And the result of this vulnerable dependence upon God was a ministry of real power that changed the lives of many, bringing healing and hope. And this is the way of the kingdom of God. 
And now in this story of John's death, we are presented with a very different kind of kingdom, a kingdom that is driven by personal ambition, by the settling of scores, by the exercise of power in a brutal and a callous manner. And the outcome of this kind of kingdom is death and despair for those who find themselves on the receiving end of such power. And so we see that the kingdom of God is very different from the kingdoms of this world. And then there is John the Baptist himself. Sometimes we, we refer to him as the forerunner. In other words, the one who goes before Jesus to prepare the way. And in this passage, we get to see that he does this in more ways than one. John, hailed by Jesus as greater than any of the prophets who had ever lived, ends his life as an innocent victim. And not many months later, Jesus himself trod the same path as we know. But of course, the story of Jesus is not complete with his death. There is more, indeed much more, to come. And it is, of course, what follows that makes the story of Jesus gospel or good news. And that is the context in which we must read this awful story of the death of John the Baptist and still proclaim it as gospel and worthy of praise to God. For we know that death is not the end, that not even death can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. When we read this story, we are reminded that God, God does not stand removed from the tragedies and the torments of this life. Far from it. In Jesus, he has suffered the cruel injustices of this world. In Jesus, he has suffered the worst that human beings can do to each other. And yet, he has overcome and he has forgiven. The cross of Christ is the point at which defeat is turned into victory. And as we read of the death of John the Baptist today at the hands of Herod, we can reflect that whilst he had the power to order the death of John, there is a power much greater than that of Herod, the power of life and death. This is the power that John the Baptist bore witness to, and this is the power that we celebrate and remember whenever we gather to worship. It is the power that gave us the gift of life in the first place. It is the power that sustains that life that is within us. It is the power that will carry us beyond this mortal life into something altogether greater and better. So yes, this is indeed a grim story, but it is still gospel and we can still praise God. There is hope in our world which suffers. Now some of you will know that I spent much of my childhood in Uganda, a beautiful and a lovely country. But it is also a country that suffered terribly under the brutal dictator Idi Amin between 1971 and 1979. And one of his most, most infamous acts was the killing of Archbishop Janani Lawum in 1977 because of Lewum's opposition to Armin's excesses. The death of Janani Lewum was a huge blow to the Christians in Uganda under Armin, and nothing can erase the brutality of that event, or indeed the suffering of many other Christians under Armin. But it has to be said that many Ugandan Christians who lived through that dreadful period can speak more eloquently of the victory that we have in Jesus than most of us who have never suffered such persecution. They would be able to tell you that in the midst of persecution, with barbarous acts every bit as bad as the death of John the Baptist happening all round them, God was still present. He was still there. There was always hope. This world can indeed be a tough place. And we human beings, well, we have a tendency to make it such. But there is always gospel 
there is always God good news and we can still find a voice to praise God for he is always present even in the darkest of places and his kingdom which will ultimately prevail rests not on power abused but rather on a vulnerable love which can never be extinguished. No matter how hard life is, there is always hope to be found in Christ. As Paul puts it famously in his letter to the Romans, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's now come before the Lord in prayers of intercession, shall we? And in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promise through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Strengthen our bishops and all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Bless and guide Elizabeth, our Queen. Give wisdom to all in authority and direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and of peace, that we may honour one another and seek the common good. Give grace to us, our families and our friends and to all our neighbours, that we may serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. And hear us as we remember those who have died in the faith of Christ. According to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. And rejoicing in the fellowship of all your saints, we commend ourselves and the whole of creation to your unfailing love. We join together in the words that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now let's share in the peace, shall we? We are all one in Christ Jesus. We belong to him through faith, heirs of the promise of the Spirit of Peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The peace of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took 
God flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and mind in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you today and always. Amen. <laughs>